Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us and joining our session today. For those who haven't been acquainted with me or the Sandbox, I'm Mackenzie. I'm a part of the team of five members of the Sandbox team. We're located downtown Barrie and online to connect people and their ideas to business resources on their journeys to success. Today we have our experts in residence financial growth session that is about financial forecasting, the importance of solid financial forecasting, and how um, you can help your business prepare for growth and expansion. So before we introduce our presenter today, just a couple quick house rules. We will be doing questions at the end. So anytime you have a question pop in your head throughout, just feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll get to them at the end there. So um, today with us, we have Jeff Bond of the York Civco CFO Center. Jeff brings more than 20 years of diverse ex executive financial operations experience acquired in the public financial services, healthcare, environmental services, and e-commerce sectors. Jeff is a CFA with strong operational business expertise, having worked in both entrepreneurial and corporate environments, including three startups. So, uh, We'll jump right into it. I know um, an hour of your time during especially this nice weather in the summer, summer months um, is a lot to ask. So without further ado, please welcome Jeff to start us off. Thanks very much, Mackenzie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy to, uh, to join. Um, as Mackenzie had mentioned, I'm with the uh, CFO Center. Been working with them for about a year. Uh, we provide part-time CFOs to organizations targeted at the small and medium-sized business sector who don't need, don't want, or can't afford a full-time CFO. Uh, my portfolio, as Mackenzie mentioned, is mostly York Simcoe. Uh, I've got one client down in the York region, and the, the rest are in the Simcoe region here. And um, I've got um, an active portfolio of about six clients uh, in the region, and enjoying working with them all. And they all have similar challenges and opportunities and some unique things as well. And they're in quite a cross section of industries. So uh, happy to be here today and wanted to talk a little bit about financial forecasting and execution. Uh, I've got a short slide deck that I'll use to kind of cue us through the um, presentation piece and then happy to take any questions at the end of it. Uh, we should be able to get through the presentation fairly quickly. Um, so, Really, you know, in terms of a financial forecast, it all starts with the strategic planning mindset, uh, reflecting the vision for the business. So uh, when you look at the future state that's desired of your business operations, typically a forecast will be three to five years out. Uh, five years is a, considered to be a long time. Three years is sort of the average, and two years would sort of be the minimum that uh, the financial community is looking for and, and that I recommend to my clients uh, from an operational and planning perspective. And, you know, you look at things like vision, value, uh, you know, what's the, uh, what's the purpose of the forecast? It should serve, in my opinion, of multiple purposes, uh, not just simply for the banks or a particular point in time, but as a living tool that management can use to, uh, you know, manage the business. And um, you know, look at things like the market size and conditions that you're working in uh, and uh, doing a, you know, an analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the operation, opportunities and threats, and what your financial vision is in terms of your target for revenue, uh, you know, what kind of value creation you're looking at. And the plan is essentially to provide a roadmap to achieve the vision, something that you can check in. Um, and uh, if you just wanna move forward, Mackenzie. So your vision is really like a destination on a roadmap. Uh, you know, you have to plan how you're going to get there. Uh, you want to pick the best route. Uh, what resources are you going to require in order to achieve your vision? Uh, in this case, it would be a mode of transportation. Are you taking a bus, a car, uh, some other, um, you know, some other mode? Uh, and what are your options around the fastest route, the shortest route? Uh, and, you know, those routes are going to have turn-by-turn -turn directions and milestones along the way uh, that you want to be able to measure. And, um, you know, when you put a plan like this in place, you know, you've got a clear set and understanding of what you want to achieve and how you're going to get to, which is essentially your plan. Uh, so it's really no different than this. 
so it connects uh, you really the vision that you have with the business uh, uh, to your current situation, pivoting off of that. So, as I said, it provides a roadmap for the um, you know for the entire period of your plan, be it two years to five years, uh, and with sufficient granularity to cover things like your product and geographic sales mix, uh, your um, you know. Uh, investments that you're making in product development or capacity. Uh, and I recommend to my clients that it's a monthly forecast. So month by month for at least two years, uh, ideally three, uh, on a rolling basis. And I'll talk a little bit about the rolling basis later. Uh, but it considers the impact of, you know, different things and risks for your business, plans for contingencies. If you've got a lot of foreign exchange exposure, you know, testing for you know, the risk of movements in the, you know, Canadian versus other currencies, depending on what your operating currency is. Uh, and ident it's really important to identify really critical milestones and when you think those can be achieved. So if you're looking at an expansion that's going to require a capital investment, you know, when do you expect that to occur? Uh, and how close are you as you move through your forecast period to achieving that? Um, and I always suggest that it's comprehensive enough, uh, including the you know, completeness of the cost of capital um, being critical. So comprehensive to me being, you know, balance sheet, income statement, forecasts, uh, and the generation of a cash flow forecast, which is very critical. Uh, and um, so what it does is um, enable sensitivity analysis and scenario planning. Uh, you should be able to go in and toggle uh, your critical assumptions to see what impact it has, not only, you know, on your, on your near term, but longer term. Uh, you know, if you make a certain assumption around taxation uh, rates that, you know, may turn out to be different uh, in this environment with COVID-19, we may be looking at changes in certain payroll taxes or corporate taxes coming up because the government has to pay for, you know, all of the funding that's been required during this pandemic you can toggle those uh, sensitivities and uh, see what it looks like, you know, a year out, two years out and how it impacts on your plan. Uh, and then uh, the detailed cash flow forecast, you know, again, a minimum of two years, but that's really going to be the critical element because that's going to drive what your, what your capital needs. If outside capital is required, it's going to be very important to get an understanding of when that might occur. So you can start planning for it. So as I said, uh, you know, cash flow forecasting is critical, uh, particularly if you're entering into a period of anticipated growth in sales, uh, because sales will consume cash, uh, depending on the kind of business that you're in. Uh, you, you may be having to order equipment, uh, building inventories, uh, you know, development of a product, uh, and the hiring of personnel prior to receipt of payments. As I said, depending on the business that you're in, you could have some significant outlays. Uh, so growth is great. We all want to achieve growth in our business and, and move it forward and, um, you know, kind of expand our horizons. But you have to recognize and understand that, you know, especially rapid growth can consume cash pretty quickly. And I think it's important to understand that when that occurs, you know, you're going to have to have uh, resources in place in order to be able to keep fueling your growth. Uh, from the perspective of measurement, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, having a, you know, a forecast that is, you know, you know, fairly general and not maybe comprehensive. The more important thing is, is that continuous measurement. So continuously reviewing results. This isn't something that you should put together uh, and put in a drawer uh, or use only once to say, you know, arrange a working capital line with your bankers or to secure additional investment uh, from your shareholders or new shareholders. Uh, it's really a tool that should be used, updated monthly. Uh, you know, use it as a tool for management to review how well you're doing against plan uh, and understand the variances. So, you know, on a line by line basis, if you were projected to be at a certain level of expenditure and it turns out that you're double that, well, why is that? Uh, it allows for regular review as to whether or not we're on or off plan. Uh, and then it allows also for relating your financial performance back to the initiatives and actions that you've taken. You may have to course correct and just say, you know, we were looking at, at, at getting our receivables 
day sales outstanding down from 60 days to 45 days, and that's not doesn't seem to be happening. Why is that? Perhaps the plan we put in place needs to be adjusted uh, to allow us to you know hit that that goal. Uh, and so it just allows for that continuous dialogue uh, with your team in terms of making that happen. Uh, and then uh, I like to align them to the actual chart of accounts and and financial reporting format that's currently in place because we take the actuals and, and, and embed those into the plan as we move forward. So each month the plan gets updated for the actual results. And so when I'm putting a forecast together, I don't put a forecast together that looks completely different than my financial reporting format uh, because it doesn't allow for those comparisons. So you want to take a look at your current reporting formats and you know, project out uh, on that basis and make adjustments where you need to, but it allow for consistency and measurement and reporting um, as well as forecasting. And so, you know, be like apples to apples and, and the communications will be a lot clearer, including, uh, uh, you know, the achievement of certain key performance indicators. Uh, continuous measurement also uh, drives and keeps people on point with regard to the vision. Uh, and accountability for what they own as part of the process. So each of your individual managers, key people in your operation that have ownership over certain initiatives or milestones, um, just allows for that continuous dialogue. And if it looks like the achievement of those milestones may be at risk, it could be to a number of different factors and making sure that that communication is persistent so that you can understand those factors and make adjustments where necessary. Um, and that kind of weaves into, you know, acting as a business control, uh, which doesn't leave any significant variances in what your expectations were to what your actuals were unexplained uh, and allows, again, for that dialogue and early communication, particularly with key stakeholders, you know, like your bankers, like your investors, uh, major customers, if it looks like plans are, you know, off, off track and starting to go off track, then the earlier the better because it's a confidence factor and allows for good communication with your key stakeholders as well. So in terms of uh, monitoring future conditions, we talked a little bit about scenario planning uh, and sensitivity analysis. So just again, like you're driving you know, in your car and you've got a destination and a plan on how to get there, if suddenly you hear there's an accident on the 401, you need to change course uh, or else your plan to arrive at your destination could be significantly disrupted. So this continuous review and looking at, you know, changing future conditions and current conditions, you know, is really critical um, to assure that you get to your destination without a major interruption in your, in your timeline. Uh, and, um, you know, so being able to continuously kind of run those sensitivities and look at major changes. So if a, uh, say for example, a new piece of legislation is introduced that will increase you know, workplace costs. Uh, you wanna know what the impact of that is gonna be and what adjustments you may need to make as to what you are planning to do because you may have, from a cash flow per perspective, defer some expenditures or defer some investments or to finance them differently uh, as you go forward. So this is why this continuous monitoring is really critical. If you look at it another way, uh, you know, looking at projected sales, if you were exporting into another market uh, and it looks like, you know, <laughs> three or four years out, you're way off your forecast uh, from your projected sales, you want to measure early and you want to act early as to, you know, why is this happening? It could be happening for a number of reasons. One is it could be execution, uh, maybe a contract that you thought you were going to have uh, went to a competitor. Uh, or it could be that the original pre premise maybe was flawed and maybe needs to be challenged. Uh, it may need to be tested if you were projecting a 10% annual rate of growth. Maybe it's not 10%, maybe five is more realistic, you know, allows for some of that testing, but early and often action uh, will keep you closer uh, to your projections, uh, you know, more often than not. Uh, so the benefits, Really, it's understanding your funding requirements, uh, having the detail and the cash flow to help you understand how much and when you'll need access to funding is really critical, particularly from a timing standpoint. Uh, allowing early visibility to consider different sources of capital, to plan for them, um, you know, to look at 
your capital structure in terms of, you know, you may have some loans, some shareholder loans or related party loans that you want to repatriate or to refinance. Uh, you know, you've got to have a sense as to what your forecast looks like to be able to, you know, to do that, to have a discussion with your bankers to say, you know, I've got some related party loans from family and friends. If we're successful, I'd like the opportunity to pay those down and our cash flows indicate that we can do that. So you can have a meaningful dialogue with your bankers about, you know, what are the triggers? What's going to allow us to do that um, and sort of keep everybody happy and reward the people that initially invested in you to, uh, you know, to be able to get their capital out and maybe with a return. Uh, and it will in improve the achievement of the vision by just, you know, increasing uh, accountability across the organization as long as there's regular dialogue uh, and looking at variances early in the process as opposed to two, three years out. Why didn't we achieve our vision 2021? Well, because maybe back in 2019 when, you know, we could do something about it, we put our forecast in the drawer and went about our business uh, and didn't revisit it on a frequent basis. Uh, and again, you know, that achievement of that vision is really going to be about keeping on top of changing conditions. Uh, you know, nobody could have seen COVID-19, the pandemic coming, but, you know, once it was in place, certainly with all my clients, we've been, you know, immediately forecasting, well, what does it look like? How long is it going to last? What does it mean for our business? Is it a V-shaped shaped recovery or is it a U-shaped or does it have a longer tail on it? And looking at different you know, futures, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to that, to be able to say, okay, in a worst case scenario, how would we manage through that? And what does it look like from a financial perspective? And what are we going to need to get through? Uh, and really just enhances the overall control over the business, and which can be quite liberating, you know, for stakeholders. I Clients I've worked with have said, you know, I wish I had had this in place a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, when I was going through everything I was going through, I might be in a better position today. Um, just want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about the mechanics uh, from my perspective. Uh, you know, history is a good guide to the future in a lot of cases. So, you know, look at your historical financials. Um, typically, when I'm starting working with a client, I go back three years to do an analysis, uh, you know, a vertical analysis in terms of, you know, what's the cost structure of the business? What are the margins on the different products? Um, and from a forecasting perspective, I sort of use the last trailing 12 months as a barometer and a basis and a starting point to start projecting out the balance sheet, the profit and loss, uh, look at the different cost structures for you know, direct versus indirect costs, what's the fixed cost versus a variable cost in the business and how do we drive those? And then making sure that you know, there's, there's a standard cash flow statement that integrates with the profit and loss and, and balance sheet uh, you know, to be able to, to determine you know, at various stages, what's the cash flow impact of what it is that we're forecasting uh, and proposing to do. Uh, and they're all very integrated, um, particularly from a working capital standpoint. How quickly are we getting, you know, paid by our customers? How quickly do we have to pay our suppliers? Are there major inventory purchases that we're going to have to make that may not be funded immediately out of revenue and we may not get deposits on from customers? Um, and the devil is in the details. So I like to build a detailed forecast. You can always roll it up uh, for presentation purposes or, you know, for digestion purposes. But I like to drive things out of key drivers and assumptions, uh, you know, toggle revenue growth, things like inflation assumptions, taxation assumptions, your day sales outstanding, uh, your day's payables outstanding, inventory, all those kinds of things that can have a major impact on your financial position at any point in time and your, your future and current cash flows. Uh, also allows you to develop what if scenarios. So, you know, if you've got a set of assumptions, you can quickly see that, uh, you know, if I toggle this and say, well, instead of 1.7% inflation, what if that's double? What if we get into an inflationary environment? What does that do to my cost structure? Let's have a quick look at that. And allows you just to run what ifs and different futures. Uh, you know, to determine on a worst case basis, what does it look like? What does a best case look like? Uh, and on a probability weighted basis, what is our base case? Um, I tend to like to drive, uh, uh, you know, things like fixed assets and other long lived investments through separate schedules uh, in the forecast. I've dried them and pushed them into the PL and the balance sheet. 
uh, you know, including allows for additions that flow into the cash flow statement. So if you have to buy machinery and equipment, you should have a sense of the timing and what that means in terms of your, you know, your balance sheet and your depreciation uh, expenses uh, and your cash outlays going forward. Uh, and then a capitalization schedule. So in other words, what's your cost structure? Are you raising new equity? Are you going to raise new debt? What are the existing debt instruments that you've got in place, you know, costing the company each month from an amortization perspective, also from a, you know, a, an interest expense perspective. Um, and those should all be, you know, driven into, you know, the balance sheet and the cash flow and the interest expense into your profit and loss. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned before, it allows you to do scenario analysis, set different conditions, test against different futures, and land on that probability weighted plan, which becomes your plan uh, moving forward. Uh, and again, I can't stress this enough, and that's why I've triple asterisk it, uh, is it's not just for the bank or a point in time. Um, it should be used as a management tool updating it monthly, propagating it forward, like a rolling 36 month plan that allows you to continue to measure adjustments that you're making uh, and determine whether we're on or off plan, where and why. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to turn it over for questions and, and that's all I had from a presentation standpoint. Awesome, thanks Jeff. So we can get to some questions here. The first question is, um, what would you say are some best, best methods for pitching for and obtaining financial sponsorships or supporters? This may not have to do with obviously financial forecasting, but uh, maybe you can give some insight into that. Yeah, I think, I think from you know, my perspective and experience is, is that really understanding your market um, and who you're, including who your competitors are is really critical and making sure that as you approach organizations and individuals for financial sponsorship or support, that they come away with a real confidence that this person has done their homework, uh, they understand the market that they're in, the business that they're in, they have a very clear vision of what they want to do, it's, it's, it's rooted in passion, uh, and they've been able to articulate it very, very clearly and concisely without a lot of verbiage uh, and understand, you know, what some of the risks are and they've mm -hmm. thought about those risks and they thought about the rewards and they've thought about different scenarios and outcomes and they've done a thorough job kind of thinking through, you know, what business they're actually in, who their target customers are and understanding the market. I, I, where I see people fall down the most and I've been, I've been, you know, party to this is that, you know, you come and you say, nobody's got what I've got. And that's a first red flag people look at and say, no, there's always somebody out there with a different mouse trap, whether it's better, we don't know, but it's certainly there's going to be somebody out there, particularly if it's a market that's really attractive. Mm -hmm. Good markets attract competitors and you want that. You want competition because it, it shows that it's a vibrant market. Awesome. The next question is, how can I tell if my forecast is reasonable? Well, you know, certainly test it against uh, your history. Uh, you know, if suddenly, you know, your forecast, you're carrying, say, your average receivables balance is a million dollars and suddenly you've got a forecast showing it's $200,000, well, all of a sudden $800,000 of cash just got flushed into the, the company, you know, that's going to be something that's a red flag to say, okay, let's test it for continuity. So I typically do continuity tests as we're building the forecast. And this is all part of the the building process is continuously revisiting it for reasonability. Uh, you know, when I'm working with owners, I, you know, I involve them heavily in the process. I don't do it in a vacuum and you shouldn't do your, you, you should continuously test it when you're building out your forecast and projections to reality test it along the way, because they can be depending on your business, a lot of work, a lot of heavy lifting um, at a time when, you know, you've got to run your business as well. Uh, and uh, so having that continuous dialogue with your partners, but you know, certainly when you look at some of your, your continuity, your carrying balances, your margins, uh, if all of a sudden your margins have spiked up, you know, again, from an average, you know, product margin of say 40% to 60%, you know, that's something where I think you need to take a look at your assumptions and why is that? And then there may be a good reason for that. It's just understanding it to say that at this point, you know, we're shifting into a different product mix. 
we're no longer going to produce as much of that product, but we're going into this product because it has a much better margin uh, for offering. So, you know, I, I look at it and say, okay, from a historical standpoint, as we flow into the forecast, uh, are there any red flags in there? Is there anything that's spiking up and down? Um, you know, hockey sticks are something that people look at. You know, it's just like growth is going to go like this. Um, it typically doesn't happen that way. In some cases, yes, it can. Uh, particularly if you're landing a major customer, like your first major customer, you know, you can have a significant uh, increase in your uh, revenue, which is all, all well and good if you've researched it and it's bona fide. Uh, but that's where your cash flow forecast is going to become critical because that new customer is probably going to cause a consumption of cash as you get ready to deliver on it. So, you know, lots of different checks and balances that you can put in. Uh, one of the ways that I look at reasonability is to build in key ratios, uh, like your working capital ratios, your current ratios, um, you know, different, different um, profit and loss and balance sheet ratios that can flag for you where you may have, you know, something in your forecast that may not be quite right because all of a sudden the ratio is moving, you know, in one month to another month or one quarter to another word, quarter in a significant direction. Perfect. Somebody's asking, what is the ideal financial forecast in a perfect world, I guess? <laughs> well, ideal financial forecast, depending on your vision, is one that shows that, uh, you know, you're able to grow the business profitably um, and that there were rewards for the stakeholders and that everybody is sufficiently rewarded so that your forecast is showing that you're, you know, the people who are, you know, um, having faith in you by lending you money, by investing in your company are going to get a, their money back with a, you know, a decent return um, if they're a lender and money back with, you know, a, a, you know, an even better return if they're a shareholder and taking more risk. Um, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect forecast or ideal because it really depends on the business that you're in. Um, but it has to be, you know, measured, uh, reasonable, long enough in duration, comprehensive enough so that you can see the different parts of it. Uh, and test them and you know, with rigor and revisit them as it relates to all the different elements of your profit and loss. Uh, and um, it really is industry to industry. You know, one, one forecast you know, that shows tremendous growth of 100% per year may be appropriate for one business, but in a mature industry or with a mature company, you know, maybe 5% is more appropriate. So you know, there's really no one, uh, one forecast that, that kind of fits all. And that's, you know, part of the challenge is I'm out there continuously looking in the market to see if there's a third party that's come up with a forecasting tool that makes it quick and easy uh, so that I don't have to build them at <laughs> yeah. expenses and I can just use them. The problem I've always run into is, is that they're not tailor made to a particular organization, you know, who may set up their chart of accounts in a certain way and they may have a different business structure or shareholder structure or something that's unique. So every business has its unique elements that some of the models, although they're fantastic when you look at them on a, you know, on a, on a kind of a can basis, they do wonderful things. The problem is, is that the logic tends to be a little bit rigid. And, and so again, it just gets back to the point. There's no one perfect forecast, but uh, you know, one that, that delivers on some of the initial things that I mentioned, I think is really the, the one to go. It's reasonable, it's well-grounded. Um, it shows people that management has thought through the different issues uh, that allows them to measure, you know, when we're, we're on top of things. I, I just, if you don't, if I could take a second here just to talk about a personal experience. Absolutely. When I was a CFO of a business, uh, we had a forecast in place to, uh, to take out an existing shareholder uh, and consolidate the ownership with one individual and the bank at the time was more than happy to provide the financing uh, and right away out of the gate in the first quarter we were going to miss our covenant uh, because we upon taking full ownership came across an issue that wasn't disclosed at the time of the deal the transaction was consummated uh, and so it caused us to miss but because we were on top of it we had a plan and the ability to show our lenders, you know, here's the issue. We're telling you way ahead of time mm -hmm. uh, where you measure it. We're going to be off covenant and here's what we're doing about it. And that gave them a lot of confidence that, you know, management is on top of this and they're measuring this going forward. And sure enough, they gave us a technical waiver. They said, you've given us the appropriate amount of time to go to credit and we've talked about it. We 
told them what the plan is. They've said, okay, we'll allow for the technical waiver. And then after that, we were on covenant for the rest of the time. And so it was never a question of, you know, whether we needed financing. It was always, well, how much do you need? Mm -hmm. uh, but that was really a confidence factor that came out of an event that was negative. Mm -hmm. uh, because we were on top of it and we were able to have that conversation. So, sorry, that's a very long answer, but. No, that's uh, great. That's a great that example. Yeah. And you mentioned um, continuity testing. What is like in previously, like what does that involve and what does that include? Well, it's, you know, if you have a, uh, say, you know, depending on what you're producing your financial statements on, if you've got say a trailing 12 months of financials, uh, with, you know, different, different levels in your chart of accounts for, you know, your, your revenue lines, your direct cost lines, your overhead lines, uh, all of those things. And if you have your forecasts and your actuals and you look at them side by side, you can see kind of trailing through. So what I like to do is I like to take a trend of the actuals through the forecast to see if there's any major blips. That's what I mean by continuity. If there's mm -hmm. suddenly a break, it might be a break in logic or it might be reflective of something that's tangible and uh, very um, intentional, uh, you know, by your, by your team and yourself in terms of saying, okay, well, what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to be, you know, collecting off of a customer, say, for example, that has been a large customer, has been a challenge in terms of collections, has been a great customer from a profit standpoint, but has always been difficult in terms of dotting the I's and crossing the T's and making sure that we're getting paid uh and that last payment is coming off the books so suddenly our you know our receivables is going to be in much better shape uh and you look at it and you say okay our, our day sales outstanding was you know 70 days on average to collect and it's now suddenly going to be improving to you know 45 days well why is that happening mm -hmm. it may be because we know that that customer you know is going to make their final payment at this point in time and they've taken on average 90 to 120 days to pay that's going to change things significantly. So really understanding, and, and that should, you know, if, if, you've, if you've built it along the way with that mindset and you've tested it and challenged it as you're building it uh, for your logic, uh, you know, you shouldn't see too many, um, but it does allow you to, you know, pick ones out and, and challenge them and look at it and say, why is that the case? Mm -hmm. Is that a problem with our assumption? Maybe that's not reasonable. Uh, maybe we need to revisit that. Let's talk about that. Uh, and so that's why I think it's important and I hope that answered that question. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Thank you for explaining that. Next question. How many changes are too many when it comes to changing the future course of your forecast? Um, well, I think if you're, you're making changes all the time, like month to month, we've got to change this, we've got to change that, then there's probably, that probably points to some um, early uh, flaws in, in logic and thinking. Uh, and I don't say that in a negative way. I think it's always important to challenge your thinking because mm -hmm. thinking can always change as circumstances change. Mm -hmm. Certainly this recent, pan this current pandemic has caused a lot of rethinking. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our original premises about what would happen in 2020, you know, are out the window. And so there can be major events either that are out of your control or within your control um, particularly if you have a young business that's, you know, growing rapidly, that's got some great opportunities, that's getting out of the gate, going out of one phase to another in terms of its evolution, you can, things can move around significantly. And so, you know, but if you find that you're making changes month to month, um, you know, particularly if it's around the same subject, like if, say, for example, you've got a cost element in payroll, uh, and every month we're, we keep change, having to change our payroll assumption, our payroll assumption, well, you need to maybe spend some more time with that and say, let's get a better fix on what our actual payroll costs are because you may have a lot of contract payroll. Um, for example, a lot of independent contractors or contract employees, part-time employees, and maybe we don't have as good of a fix on, you know, how much time they're actually spending. And that could lead to a number of things is are they being deployed properly? Mm -hmm. um, so it is a, it, it can signal, you know, a, a deeper, a deeper understanding required of certain elements of your forecasts uh, and, you know, and your business. Perfect. And this seems to be like the last question. So if anybody has any other questions, feel free to type it in there. Um, I guess from you also having a uh, background in startups, what would be the best first step for a small business owner 
to take when it comes to financial forecasting? Um, I think, you know, with regard to a startup, it's always a challenge because everything is new. Uh, but having a real understanding of what, what the offering is of the market, uh, what is reasonable from the standpoint of market capture, uh, you know, is a challenge. Often people will go in and say, okay, the market is really understanding the size of the market, uh, how big it is, who your competitors are, what your penetration rate is likely to be, how long that's going to take. Um, and then really having discussions, you know, with, with potential customers and customers that are near in the pipeline where you can say, you know, we're, we're really at the point of landing two or three customers, you know, build those specifically into your forecast and look at it, you know, customer by customer, you know, build your, your pipeline of revenue opportunities and understanding what your costs are going to be to deliver. But revenue is so critical, particularly when you're in a startup and really understanding that. And I would say that versus an existing business that's been in business for two or three years at least, that you spend probably 75% of your time when you're thinking about a forecast on your revenue model uh, and really understanding what the timing is going to be and you know, being out in the market and really testing. There's a real appetite for this. And we've got, you know, you may have five cu um, potential customers already listed that are saying, look, when you're ready to go, we're ready to buy. And that's great because you can build those directly into the forecast. But when it comes to the rest and thinking about the pipeline, you know, really understand the size of the market and be realistic about how much you can capture and how quickly, particularly if you're a new, you know, it's a new offering uh, because people want to say, okay, you really have to prove it. And I don't want to be the first to put up my hand because of the risk of dealing with a new supplier. I have I'm happy with my existing supplier, but you're promising a better product at a lower price or a better product at the same price or even at a higher price. I'm more interested in the quality, but I have to see the proof. And so, you know, be, just be realistic about it because if you're not, uh, it will be a hard to raise outside capital and B, you don't want to be stuck with a negative surprise and going back to your investors or lenders and saying, you know, we misunderstood the market or we missed on landing a particular customer and we missed on our timeline. And so, now we're, you know, we're, we're short on working capital and we need more financing. Mm -hmm. That's a hard conversation to have with people. Mm -hmm. I bet. And do you find that like um, most startups or people who can take all of this information, especially, but even all of just these little tips of to have a solid financial forecast from the very beginning, have success within like their first couple of years, if they can take all of this to do this from the very beginning? More often than not, yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, any, it's like with anything else. I mean, you know, with your product development, it would be the same thing. You just have to apply that rigor. And it's an investment that it's all part of starting up a business, that investment that you make in planning. Um, being realistic um, is really critical because, you know, you're the one that's taking most of the risk, um, which means you'll get most of the reward. But when you're starting a business, it's it's a real challenge and, and you're taking on the challenge of bigger and everybody's excited and what we find often with our clients that are, are early stage is that there's this initial excitement and buzz that happens when you've got your first client and, and then you hit a wall, say in, in one to two years where you're kind of at that, you know, well, we grew the business to a certain point and now we've kind of flatlined and we, we have to change our, our thinking. And then everybody gets, you know, a little, not down, but everybody kind of loses a little bit of energy mm -hmm. and then you need something to kind of re-energize the business and, uh, uh, kind of get things going again. So you need to say, okay, we're, we're not, we're no longer that company. We've now evolved into a different kind of company with different needs. Mm -hmm. um, and recognizing that along the way is that all companies have stages in their growth. Mm -hmm. um, the initial stage is different from the, uh, you know, the startup stage is different than the initial growth stage, you know, with is different than scaling up. Um, you know, once you start to have something that can be replicated over and over again, you know, with success, success, um, that's a different type of a business that you've suddenly built and you just need to kind of recognize that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I don't think we have any more questions left for today. So um, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining our conversation today. It was super helpful. Um, the amount of information that we got in this the amount of time was awesome. So um, I'm not sure I, if you have anything else, um, but I would be happy to close it out if, you're finished here, Jeff. 
Uh, no, that's what I had for today. Um, I hope it was helpful. Uh, uh, the Sandbox has a, a copy of my presentation, and um, if people want to access it, I'm sure it would be available. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I'm sure you can follow up through uh, the Sandbox or uh, they know how to reach me. So Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeff. And he's absolutely right. We will be providing this recording online um, as a blog with the presentation if anybody who didn't make it today um, and signed up um, needs to access it again. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. Next week, we have two experts in residence sessions as well. One with Shopify. It is a um, open virtual office hour. So if you have any questions about Shopify, we have an expert there to answer. And then we also have Barristan Law talking about commercial leases. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on right now, especially with the pandemic in terms of commercial leasing. So they'll be able to answer your questions there as well. Um, you can find us at Sandbox Center on all social, social accounts and at sandboxcenter.com for other resources. So thank you again for joining today and have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.